My name is Dr. Tanya Dugat Wycliffe. I'm an engineer, an entrepreneur, and full professor of practice here in the College of Engineering at a and Now, Dr. Tanya is the image that I have today, but I worked long and hard to get here. See, when I was 14 years old, I was the apple of my daddy's eye, his future Barbara Jordan. I was the hope of my mother and a shining example in my southeast Texas town of Liberty. But by age 16, I was a disappointment, a failure, a cautionary tale of dashed hopes and dreams. All because at the age of 15, I uttered two words. Pregnant. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell the story. See, one day I was playing in my Liberty High School basketball game. I was serving as the vertically challenged point guard. I received the ball on a fast break. I head down the court, and the funny thing is, everybody passes me up. They even set up in a zone defense before I could get to the other end, although I had had a head start. My coach was furious, called a timeout, benched me yelling, do God, what's wrong with you? And I never went back in the game. I had to divulge after that game what I had found out earlier that day. I was pregnant and I was paralyzed by fear, shame, and confusion. So I plowed through the next months of my life not knowing what to do. But I knew my life had been forever changed. And the best I hope was yet to come. So as I am preparing, the next thing you know, I'm from a small town, the murmuring started. Look at her. And they thought she was gonna be something. Ain't gonna be nothing. Might have had book sense, but she didn't have a lick of common sense to go get like that. Two words, and everybody gave up on me. My dad cried for what could have been. I had to apologize to my family and publicly to my church for disappointing them and God. Two words. It destroyed the image of who I was and replaced it nine months later with a seemingly hopeless image, that of a teen mom. See, this was 1979, before those MTV shows that popularized being a teen mom or a single mom, and I was both. Back then, the image of a pregnant teen was not a good one, and it's not great now. Parenthood, the number one cause that young teen girls drop out, and 50% of them never graduate from high school. In fact, less than 2% ever go on to get a college degree before they turn the age of 30. And more than two-thirds of families started by people like me, they're living in poverty. Now, add to that, I'm black, I was from a small town, I was already living below the poverty line at that time with my mother who was disabled from an industrial accident. With all that, I was more likely to get hit by lightning than to stand before you today as Dr. Tanya. So how did I get from pregnant teen to PhD in engineering? Well, there were a lot of people and circumstances, events that helped me, because nobody really pulls themselves up by their own bootstraps. I was so blessed that I finally came to the realization that who I was then did not define who I could become. And then I had to learn to slay, that is to conquer and to overcome in order for me to really slay in life. 
that's hip hop vernacular <laughs> for achieving and doing well. So in order for me to slay in school, I had to overcome the voices of the bullies who would tell me what I could not do and even conquer my own self-doubt and my feelings of inadequacy. In order for me to slay in the world of work, I had to overcome stereotypes, depression, self-doubt. In order for me to slay in entrepreneurship, I had to get beyond that fear fear of the unknown, fear of failure, and fear of not knowing where my next paycheck was coming from. Now that fear is real. And it was never more real than the summer of 1980 when my son Jamar was born. I looked at him and I made a decision that would change my life. I decided to give him the absolute best that I could. And I didn't have stuff to give him, but I could give him the best in me. So with that motivation, I excelled in everything that I pursued. And nearly two years later, I was the only black honor graduate in my Liberty High School class of 1982, top 10%. Then I went on to the University of Houston with no help from a guidance counselor. It was, in fact, the secretary at the University of Houston's Program for Minority Engineers, Ms. Norma Kuntz. She guided me through the admission process and helped to solidify my major of mechanical engineering. Now, those undergraduate years, they were character-building experiences. For instance, my second semester, I was stranded, literally. See, there were no programs on campus or dorms that would accommodate students who had young children. So I had to live with family members and friends, and I bounced around until I literally ran out of options. So my second semester, I had to move back home to Liberty, Texas. And it was about an hour and a half drive to the University of Houston, and I had no car. We never did. So I arranged that semester with four different people so that I could commute to and from school. And sometimes that meant I had to get up at 5 a.m. and I wouldn't return until near midnight. Then I would get up and pray to God for the strength to do it all over again. Something had to change, and it did. I started working at McDonald's near campus. I was making $3.85 an hour, which was the minimum wage in 1983. So with the money I saved, I gathered some pots, some donated groceries, my clothes, and a borrowed kindergarten exercise mat as my furniture to lay on, and I proudly moved into my first apartment. It was hard. I had to work and go to school. But those challenges meant that I was finally making progress. Another such challenge that comes to mind is a class called Thermodynamics. <laughs> Woo! See, in high school, high school had been pretty easy for me, and so I didn't know that I didn't have good study skills. In fact, with the university being so large and engineering being so intimidating, I didn't even know really how to ask for help, but I mustered up the courage and I went to my professor's office hours. And I don't know why he treated me like he did, but when I asked him for help with my homework problems, he just closed the book, looked me in my eyes and said, Ms. Dugat, you should reconsider your career objectives. You're just not engineering material. I was crushed and speechless. So I gathered myself and my stuff, just walked out of his office. But I was angry, and I let that frustration fuel me through every academic challenge that I would encounter. I was determined to be an engineer and a good mother. And then finally the day came. I graduated with my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a minor in mathematics with 
multiple job offers. And we had a fish fry that day. Boy, we celebrated. It was so much fun. And I remember walking throughout, just yelling randomly, thank you, God, because I actually did it. But like with many episodes in my life, it was short-lived, that celebration, because five days later, the grandmother that had raised me and helped to raise my son, she was diagnosed with an operable cancer and died two months later. I was devastated, but I didn't have time to grieve because later that same year, I married my fiance, Tony, and gained a bonus son, Raymond. We were a wonderful blended family of four. No, five, because my mother moved in with us. No, actually six, because guess what? I got pregnant on my honeymoon. So, <laughs> in one year, I went from graduation, new husband, new job, moved to a new city, family growth, 10 years after the birth of my first son, my son Cortland's there, and we started a business. That was quite a year. And we were just settling in, getting adjusted, when my mother suddenly caught pneumonia, unexpectedly died one day before my second wedding anniversary. Now, I don't think I ever really got over that, but I continue to make progress. Finish an executive MBA and I climbed the corporate ladder and then I enrolled in my PhD program. But two months into my PhD program, the unthinkable happened. I was talking to Tony one night. We were making plans for our trip to New Orleans. We were going to have us a good weekend. And because it was late, we said, we'll finish the particulars when we talk the next day. Well, when I got to my office on campus that next day, my office mate said, you missed a very important call. And I asked, well, can you give me more information? She said, yeah, they called to say your husband died. Sorry. What? 40 years old? Heart attack in his sleep? If my mother dying, grandmother, a few aunts, even a couple classmates didn't break me, this was meant to be the straw, no, the tree trunk that would demolish me. Worst off, add to the stress he had committed to financially take care of us through my PhD program. So what was I going to do now? Well, I took it one day at a time, one challenge at a time. And the day finally arrived when this first generation college student and once discarded, pregnant teen, completed my PhD in engineering in spite of who I am and because of whose I am. See, they call people like me an anomaly when we don't subscribe to the pre-designed fates that others decide we should have. But I disagree. I just learned through my journey from pregnant teen to PhD that there is power of life and death in the tongue. And so I chose to speak life to my circumstances. And I hope that something about my journey will bless you, will benefit you, will serve as a call to action for you. Because I also eliminated two words from my vocabulary, that's can't and quit. So yes, I was a teen mom, but I learned that you have to set your goals high no matter what. And if you find yourself with a long way to go and no vehicle to get there, just don't quit. Where there's a will, there will be a way and people will come in your path to help you. And if somebody tells you what you can't do, like they did me, just remember, we define who we are, not other people. And yes, I experienced a lot of loss, death. And some people tell you to plow through it, but I had to take time to grieve. But I didn't grieve as a person without hope.
In fact, I use those precious memories to motivate me, to drive me, because I believe they're looking down on me smiling. And then finally, I learned to replace that negative talk with positive self-talk. Like, I am gonna succeed. I am more than a conqueror. I believe God has great plans for me, and I am a victor, not a victim. So in spite of my fear, I'm going to press forward, and I believe that my persistence is going to pay off with dividends that are exceedingly, abundantly, above all more than I can ask or imagine. So you all go forth now. Be encouragers. Don't judge people. And be your best authentic self always. Remember, slay daily. Thank you.